Welcome to Pod Save America. I'm John Favreau. I'm Dan Pfeiffer. On today's show, the Supreme Court hears arguments as to whether Donald Trump can run for president after participating in an insurrection and prepare to decide whether his criminal trial for trying to overturn the last election will take place before the next election. And the DOJ decides not to bring charges against Joe Biden for mishandling classified info, even though the special counsel in that investigation decided to take a few shots at him. But first, Republican politicians have spent the week finding new ways to humiliate themselves just to keep the criminal defendant who lost them the last few elections happy. Nikki Haley, herself no stranger to humiliation after a bruising 30-point loss in Nevada to the formidable none of these candidates, did do a great job summing up the cost of her party becoming a cult. What happened yesterday? Trump loses the case on having immunity for whatever comes next. Republicans lose a fight on the border. They lose a fight on Israel aid. The head of the Republican Party loses her job. Everything that Donald Trump Trump touches, it's chaos. No notes from me. What about you? <laughs> I mean, really wish she had uh, found found her voice a little bit earlier in this campaign. She might she might have beat none of the above. Like the chaos message, uh, clearly most Republican voters don't give a shit about it. They either like Trump's chaos or they don't see it as chaos. Um, but, you know, independents and swing voters have certainly rejected uh, Trump and Republican chaos in 2018, 2020, and 2022. So, And 2023. Don't leave that and one out. And 2023. Yeah. So yeah. We'll, uh, we'll see how that goes. Uh, all right. Let's start with Congress, as, uh, as Haley mentioned, where Republicans negotiated the toughest, most conservative immigration deal in decades. Then Trump ordered them to kill their own deal because he thinks chaos at the border will help him beat Joe Biden. So they killed it. They're moving ahead with a baseless and fairly useless uh, effort to impeach Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas so that Trump can have a talking point on the campaign trail. But they failed at that because uh, Republicans uh, picked a creepy backbencher for speaker who uh, can't count votes. And now that the Senate potentially does have the votes to pass the aid for Israel, Ukraine and Taiwan that a bunch of Republicans have said that they want, uh, they're going to even greater lengths to embarrass themselves by saying things like this. Finally, I, I, I just want to ask uh, whether or not this new bill that's just about foreign policy, whether you're going to vote in favor of it, uh, foreign, foreign money for, uh, for Israel, for, for what's happening in Ukraine. What do you think of that standalone foreign policy bill? David, I voted no already a few okay. minutes ago, and here's the reason why. Unfortunately, what this administration and Chuck Schumer, they are doing is using the crisis in Israel to support other priorities of the party. We should first secure our southern border. <laughs> oh, my God. No to the border deal because Biden doesn't need legislation to secure the border and no to foreign aid because it doesn't come with border legislation. It you get all that? Just... That's, that was Tim Scott, by the way. Tim, Tim Scott gave the best speech at the 2020 convention, uh, once seen as the party's fresh-faced future, and now he sounds like a, a zombie Trump bot stuck on repeat. <laughs> <laughs> it is just wild that what the Senate is trying to do right now is the exact thing that Joe Biden asked them to do four and a half months ago. All yeah. they're voting on is his request for original requests for supplemental aid for Israel, Ukraine, Taiwan, and a couple other things. That's it. And so we went through this whole process about negotiating a border deal, coming through, coming to do, combining these things because the Republicans said they need. They killed it in like 17 minutes and are back to just trying to pass the thing Joe Biden asked for. What a gigantic waste of time and tremendous incompetence from this goat rodeo of a political party that controls way too much of government. Uh, and they still might not pass uh, the national security funding bill. They might not pass it, the aid. <laughs> and, and even if they do, where is it going? Well, that's what. Yeah. What do you think happens now? So so first of all, the Senate Republicans uh, are able to propose amendments to the uh, foreign aid bill um, and <laughs> they want to amend it with. Wait for it. Border <laughs> security proposals. <laughs> Yeah. So they want to it's it's weird. They want to if only they could pass funding for Ukraine and Israel and Taiwan, but also pair it with 
like tougher border security? Wouldn't it be they should do like a deal with Democrats where they figure out, oh, yeah. Yeah. Like maybe like uh, Langford and Murphy could get in a room together, yeah. maybe try to figure this maybe out. Just, just spitballing here. Yeah, those yeah, would be they some could ideas. Do that. Um, so they're going to offer amendments, but we'll see. It might pass the Senate because, you know, a cloture vote passed. And so there's enough, there's now enough Senate votes to pass this thing. Um, but, and Mike Johnson, Hasn't yet said that it's dead on arrival in the House like he did with the combo foreign aid border mm-hmm. bill. Um, but he also has people like Marjorie Taylor Greene who has said that she'll file a motion to vacate if he lets aid for Ukraine come up for a vote. So uh, what do you think happens here? I think it's pretty hard to imagine that Mike Johnson will be able to put the, a Senate passed bill that includes funding for Ukraine on the floor of the House. I think that would be, the, I think that I imagine Marjorie Green, Taylor Greene is right. The sentence I don't say often, and that would be the end of his speakership. The whole reason they came up with this whole border security thing was to avoid taking that, that singular vote because voting on Ukraine aid, it, one, is a huge problem for him with the Freedom Caucus, but two, it drives a gigantic wedge through the middle of the Republican Party between your more traditional neoconservative anti-Russia types and the America firsters and then the people who like to cuddle up to Putin. And so he doesn't want to have that vote because it would be very bad for him. So that's what he's been trying to avoid. So it's hard to imagine that if they don't do the place where he drew the red line on border security, that he would just take this up and pass it. I I mean, the guy seems not particularly good at his job, so maybe he will stumble ass backwards into doing it. But if if you took what he said seriously, which I really recognize you should not based on the last few months of his speakership, Mm -hmm. it seems hard to imagine he would actually bring it up given that. But who the hell knows anymore? Also, as of this recording on Thursday afternoon, uh, Donald Trump hasn't weighed in yet. But if Donald Trump tells them to all vote against uh, foreign aid, they're going to vote against foreign aid. Because they do whatever Donald Trump, they have no, they have no policy preferences of their own that they won't subsume for Donald Trump. I mean, like, I'm sure some of them still have, I'm sure some Republican politicians still have policy preferences. Some of them really like tax cuts for the rich. They like to deport dreamers. They like to outlaw abortion. I can't think of a single policy preference they wouldn't sacrifice for Donald Trump. Um, They have now put electing this man again as president ahead of policy beliefs, moral beliefs, their constituents, their careers, their reputations, their own names in the case of Ronna McDaniel. <laughs> like I, 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 I actually we say cults like jokingly. I don't see how the Republican Party is different than an actual cult. <laughs> I mean, it's a strong statement there, but it, I, it's hard to poke holes <laughs> in. I'll be honest with you. <laughs> I mean, like <laughs> how, how many Republicans if Donald Trump, if Donald Trump told uh, a bunch of Republicans to uh, put on a collar, get on all fours, and he was going to walk them around Mar-a-Lago with a leash in front of a bunch of television cameras, how many would say no? I, like, a, like a handful, maybe? Yeah, I mean, it's basically what Ron DeSantis basically did before he was <laughs> president. So, yeah, I think I think that's very... I mean, I, I don't think he listens to this podcast, but if he did, I imagine he will try to do that because I imagine... He, he would he would enjoy the prospect of making some of them do that. I mean, they're all pretty close to doing that now. Um, I mean, for, I mean, f- the, l- figuratively, that's exactly what they were doing. That is exactly <laughs> what they were doing. Literally, who knows? I don't. I really want to see it, but figuratively, that is what is happening in Congress. Speaking of Republicans who've been completely neutered, uh, Mitch McConnell. Uh, do you ever think you'd live to see the day where Senate Republicans turn on Mitch McConnell for being uh, too much of a squishy? bipartisan deal maker which is apparently what all his uh, or what a lot of his senate republican colleagues are doing now they're like calling him for him to step down they want new leadership i have spent probably more time than is healthy imagining mitch mcconnell's political demise i in uh, in the many scenarios in which i imagine that i did not think it'd be one where ted cruz would get the upper hand on mitch mcconnell <laughs> so that was a surprise to me like i think this is actually a pretty significant moment because the dominant figure of republican politics in the last 20 years is mitch mcconnell It's not Donald Trump. It's not George W. Bush. It's Mitch McConnell, because all the things that Donald Trump does not exist without Mitch McConnell. Right. If you go Mitch McConnell helping change campaign finance laws going way back, Mitch McConnell stealing the Supreme Court seat to give voters permission to vote for Trump, even voters who did not like him in the 2016 election. I don't think Donald Trump wins that election on Mitch McConnell. And he's been this dominant figure in part because he he ruled with power and strength and the way the last 48 hours or so played out is a sign that he 
he has lost his fastball. It is it, his reign is essentially over. I don't. I would be surprised if he is the the Senate leader in the next Congress. It, the, oh, and I think aura. that's true. Like no matter who wins, no matter who yeah, wins the it, White 100%. House or the Senate, I think he's yeah. done. Yeah, and this that's not even just age and capacity. It is his way of governing. Once if you are if you leave, it's actually some metaphors or potentially like lessons for Trump here is that he is he ruled with an iron fist for all this time. And once you've been exposed as weak, once the people get to look behind the curtain, it is over. And this week, he was the one who demanded that bipartisan deal. He shepherded it. He supported it. He brought his staff it forward, was in the room it, the whole time negotiating. <laughs> and it blew up in his face. He misread and he voted the politics. Against it. And then he, he misread his it. right. He misread the politics. He misread his own power. And ultimate. And so this is this is the end of Mitch McConnell. It is the Mitch McConnell era in Republican politics is over. And the worst part about it is it's probably going to be replaced with something even worse than Mitch McConnell. Right? Oh, probably less. Probably less uh, effective in all the bad ways than Mitch McConnell, but even worse. Well, and there had been some debate because Mitch McConnell was like, well, you know, obviously he got rid of the filibuster for uh, Supreme Court justices, but uh, has said that he wants to uphold the filibuster for for legislative issues. And there's some debate. I get would he really do that or not? If they got back in power, wouldn't he get rid of the filibuster to pass an abortion ban or, or other priorities like that debate is uh, a moot. That debate is moot now because yeah. there will be no Mitch McConnell and the next Republican leader in the Senate will absolutely get rid of the filibuster. Do you think President Donald Trump is going to care about the the history and decorum of the Senate filibuster if it's standing in the way of him passing an abortion ban or some other piece of horrendous legislation he wants? Of no, course not. Which is all the more reason why, like, Donald Trump wins the presidency and Republicans win the Senate. Like, the chances of a national abortion ban, extremely high. Extremely high. And I think they've, like, they've gotten higher over, since Dobbs happened. Oh, 100%. 100%. I agree with that. Um. We talked about how Trump and Republicans intentionally stoking chaos at the border is a huge political opening for Democrats. Biden started hitting them on that front from the White House this week. Um, But I don't know that anything could be more politically effective than uh, some of the sound bites we've heard from Republicans themselves. Uh, Here's ultra conservative senator turned rhino cuck trader James Lankford talking on the Senate floor this week. In fact, I had a popular commentator four weeks ago that I talked to that told me flat out before they knew any of the contents of the bill, any of the content, nothing was out at that point, that told me flat out, if you try to move a bill that solves the border crisis during this presidential year, I will do whatever I can to destroy you. Because I do not want you to solve this during the presidential election. Fun fact, um, right-wing radio host Jesse Kelly is the person that James Langford was talking about. You know Jesse Kelly? Barely. See him on Twitter once in a while? He, mm. he, he, uh, he, he tweeted this clip and he uh, took credit saying, he may be a eunuch, but I'll say this about Langford. He's got great taste in radio. <laughs> Called him a eunuch. <laughs> <laughs> See, he's a radio host, Jesse Kelly? Yeah, he's a radio yeah, host. Okay. I don't know he where, but... Yeah, you learn something new every day. Um, how hard should Biden and Democrats lean in to this argument that basically Langford was making? Do you think it's easy enough for voters to understand uh, as oftentimes whatever's happening in Congress is quite difficult for voters to understand? It doesn't really break through. But for something like this, can they get it to break through? They sure as hell got to try. Right. Yeah. I think it was great the president spoke out about it the other day. Dem- he should be speaking about it every day. He should talk about it in the State of the Union. Everyone should do it because it's not just – there are two reasons for this. One is border security is Biden's worst issue in that NBC poll that we have all hate from last weekend. He's down 35 points on who you trust more on border control and immigration. 35 points. And here we have a chance to go on offense on it. Now, you know, I think you and I talked about this before on this podcast. The argument isn't that Trump's weak on the border. It is that Trump put himself over, the, over border security. Right. And that that to me is a message that is believable, that John Trump and Republicans put their own politics ahead of what was best for the country, because that leans all your messages should be a sort of almost a nesting doll of your positive message and your negative message against your opponent. And that message against Republicans that they put them that they're unwilling to work with Democrats, they want to put their own political well-being ahead of the country. That dovetails very nicely. The most appealing part of Biden's message to a lot of voters is that he is someone who's willing to work with Republicans and Democrats who get things done, that he is 
in it to help other people. And that's just the perfect contrast. And so it, this is it's not that this particular thing is going to break through and there are going to be people running around talking about the demise of the Langford Murphy compromise. It's going to be that this is a data point to tell the larger story, which highlights why people what people don't like about Republicans, what they like about Joe Biden. So you, we got to run with this. It has to, it's, it is a rare opportunity. And it's not that often you get to go on offense on your opponent's best issue, which is border security. And I think that they need to expand it beyond border security. I mean, this is a message frame for all of the other issues, right? And it's an argument to make to voters who aren't happy with not only the border, but the cost of living, state of our politics, whatever. And Biden and the Democrats can say, we have solutions. We've been willing to reach across the aisle to get stuff done. We have gotten some stuff done by working with some Republicans over the last several years. But most Republican politicians in this party are only in this for Donald Trump. And Donald Trump is only in this for himself. And I think you just run that play on every single issue. And you can point to a whole bunch of different examples. There's also like a we haven't even talked about the tax bill that's moving through Congress that's bipartisan that would extend the child tax credit. Like, do we bet that that's going to get passed? Uh, I don't necessarily. I don't have a lot of hope well, for that, even though it would make it depends a on what Donald Trump difference. wants. Right. Exactly. And like, do they want to give Oh, and Chuck Grassley, Republican Senator Chuck Grassley already said he's against it because it would give Joe Biden a win. Well, it would also like alleviate po poverty for millions of children. But like, you know, they don't give a shit. I just think you, you, this is this is a, a really important thing, a really important message to get across. I think he's Biden especially has to do this in the State of the Union. The Grassley quote and some of the other ones that we've mentioned are just a real example. Have you ever seen a group of people who are more apt to confuse the script and the stage directions? <laughs> like, you're not, that's the reason you're killing the bill. It's not what you're supposed to say about why you're killing the bill, you fucking knuckleheads. So thank you for that. <laughs> so uh, Trump has convinced Republican politicians to basically paralyze Congress, potentially let Vladimir Putin roll through Europe. Uh, he also got Republican Party leaders to essentially rig the primary process for him. Uh, which is why Nevada gave him his own caucus tonight, Thursday night, that will award him all the state's delegates. Um, but you know what? All this was still not enough. Even though RNC chair Ronna McDaniel rigged the primary and even changed her name for Trump, she will reportedly step down after the South Carolina primary so that the boss can replace her with some stop the steel goon from uh, North Carolina. Uh it sure seems like Donald Trump has a stronger grip on the Republican Party than he ever has, despite losing them uh, uh, the last three elections and facing 91 felony counts. Um, what's up with that? Are they just giving their voters what they want? What's <laughs> Donald what's Trump's never been Donald Trump's never been more popular with Republican voters than he is right now. Yeah, that's why this is we can blame. Yes, are a bunch of these politicians weak amoral, immoral human beings unwilling to take the slightest bit of bit of a stand for on behalf of for patriotism and history and all that, of course. But the reason this is happening is Republican voters, particularly the ones who vote in primaries, love Donald Trump. They love him more than any of these other yahoos. And so are, you guys are having this conversation about um, at, on Tuesday, Tuesday, yeah, Tuesday, um, about why people so a lot of people are endorsing Trump when he's just going to toss you aside like like Ronna Romney McDaniel. And it's because you're going to lose your primary. The people who don't endorse Trump, they get set. They're done. Right. The, the, yeah. the handful of fucking morons who endorse Ron DeSantis are in a world of hurt right now because Donald Trump's going to make them pay for it. Yeah, like J James Lankford out of the party. James, James Lankford's going to get a primary in 2028. Yes. Mike Gallagher from Wisconsin, who was one of the few Republicans who voted against the Mayorkas impeachment. No. Now the party's pissed at him. They're like, you know, sick in the base after him. He's going to probably have a primary. Like it's just every single person. Mitt Romney, Liz Cheney, Jeff Flake. The, remember these people? They all stood up. They're all Mitch out McConnell of the party. now. <laughs> Mitch McConnell. Exactly. They're all toast. So at least, I mean, there's the lesson here. I guess is either you are all in and up Donald Trump's ass or you're all out and you light yourself on fire like Liz, like Liz Cheney did and Mitt Romney's doing, right? Where you at least yeah. can go down fighting for something you care about. The people who sit in the middle, like Mitch McConnell, they're the ones who end up getting completely screwed in this. Yeah, I will say that the it, it is a cycle here, the, the, the cult dynamic, because it's not just that these Republican politicians have no choice because the base loves Donald Trump so much. The base loves Donald Trump so much because all these Republican politicians 
are constantly saying how much they love Donald Trump. And so is the right wing media. And so because these Republican politicians are so scared of saying what they really think about Donald Trump, a lot of them, then the base is like, oh, all the people I'm listening to, all the information I get, all the media I see, all the leaders I, I see on TV, all the Republicans I vote for, they all love Donald Trump. So, of course, Donald Trump's awesome. Can I say one thing about the Ronna firing? Yeah. She was pretty bad at her job. <laughs> I mean, let's just be honest here, right? I mean, she, when, what, how hard was the job at this point? Well, she's in charge of the Republican Party, and the Republicans lost the 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020, 2022, and 2023 elections. So almost every single year she was in charge of the RNC, they lost seats. So, you yeah, know. Well, lipstick on a pig here. She's got Donald Trump as the party leader. <laughs> well, just, That's I'm the just irony. Saying, the guy that, the guy that like, fired her is the reason the Republican Party has been doing that, that, so poorly. That, that may be. <laughs> that, I'm not saying that she's the main reason they kept losing, but her record is not one you can really take to the bank either. I mean, oh. she's a terrible human being. I think that seems pretty clear. A person completely incapable of shame or self-awareness, but also pretty piss poor record as RNC chair. So. Think she'll go back to run a Romney McDaniel? Think she'll put the, put the Romney back in now that when she's gone? I hope she, if she shows up at a Romney family reunion, Mitch just slams the door in her face. <laughs> I guess he said nice things about her already. He said enough, nothing but love for my cousin. Oh, um, Mitch, come on. It's, it's too nice, Mitch. Blood, um, blood thicker than water, I guess. So let's talk about one of the last institutional bulwarks against a second Trump term, the judicial system. Uh, on Thursday, the Supreme <laughs> Court heard oral arguments in the case that will decide whether Trump could be kicked off the ballot in Colorado. It certainly sounded like they will rule in his favor. The conservative and liberal justices were skeptical of Colorado's case, with most of them making some version of the argument that a single state shouldn't be able to decide who the rest of the country can vote for. Uh, Notably, they didn't say much about Colorado's finding that Trump did, in fact, participate in an insurrection. They seem to want to stay away from that. Uh, so to be continued there. Um, so our usual disclaimer here, we will save the legal analysis for our friends at Strict Scrutiny. You should absolutely listen to the great conversation on Wednesday's pod about this case between Kate Shaw and Lovett, who um, he actually has his LSAT score tattooed uh, across his back. Did you know that? I uh not surprised to know that. No. Yeah, no. So you should listen to that. Uh and also you should check out uh Strict Scrutiny dropped two bonus pods this week, uh one on the 14th Amendment case and one on uh the Trump immunity case. So check those out. Um but Dan, for us political hacks, mm -hmm. what do you think uh do you think there will be political implications uh from what seems like it'll be a win for Trump here? I don't think so. I while I don't feel as strongly about this as John Lovett, I've always had some <laughs> uh, political anxiety about how this was going to play out, in part because I always assumed the Supreme Court would just put Donald Trump back on the ballot. And so we're having this conversation that seems like – that gives Donald Trump the, the opportunity to argue the system is being weaponized against him. The Democrats are the ones who are anti-democratic. Democrats are the ones who are – uh, interfering in the election, which is all bad faith bullshit. Um, but it feels like this is going to be dispensed with pretty quickly. And I don't I guess maybe Trump will try to use this as a way to say that he's not an insurrectionist. Yeah, but definitely ultimately do that. he can do that. But that is going to be so overtaken by what happens in the January 6th trial that I know yeah. we'll get to. So, yes, he could say that for a few days. I'll send some truths about it. The, the glorious Supreme Court says, you know, rules for Donald Trump. I'm not there. I did not engage in insurrection. He can say all those things. But then what will really matter is what a jury, if this trial happens on time, that a jury of 12 citizens, what they say about whether he committed insurrection or not. And so this is a little ephemeral. I'll also say that even if uh, for some reason, unlikely reason the supreme court decided that donald trump couldn't be on the ballot in colorado like can you imagine the political fallout from that <laughs> that he's not on the ballot in colorado other states have decided that he is on the ballot it doesn't necessarily even line up with the political leanings of the state right like illinois said he should be on the ballot maine said no and can you imagine like some republican state saying no he's going to be on the ballot and the democrat state i mean it could be a it would have been a fucking crazy crazy uh disaster i think <laughs> yeah that's what that's ultimately what 
always gave me like I'm not here. I'm not one to argue with, a, I don't know, a Larry Tribe or a Kate Shaw about the constitutional <laughs> merits of this, but it the, the what gave, always gave me political anxiety was it was the worst of all worlds was you were going he was going to be off the ballot in one or two states that were non-competitive. Yep. And so we would not be stopping Donald Trump in insurrections from coming to the White House. We would just be giving Donald Trump an insurrectionist the opportunity to weaponize the decisions by a few states that may help him return to the White House as an insurrectionist. Right. I agree. I agree. So the court will also likely decide next week whether to weigh in on the D.C. Circuit Court's decision that Trump is not immune from prosecution. If they do, the speed with which they hear the case and issue a ruling could mean a summer and potentially fall campaign where Trump is tried and potentially convicted for an attempted coup. Or the trial could be delayed until after the election, and if Trump wins, never happen at all. High stakes. High stakes, Dan. <laughs> yeah. uh, <laughs> what do you think a campaign looks like where the Supreme Court drags its feet and the trial gets pushed? And what does one look like where Trump is sitting in court, being tried for election subversion in the middle of both party conventions in the summer. Weird. Seems really, the whole thing seems quite weird. <laughs> I mean, I, regar regardless of the timing, what I think this is going to come down to is a huge battle to shape the outcome. Because we know from the polling, this NBC poll, where Biden's down five, but he wins by two. If you ask people if they would vote for Trump if he's convicted, the exit polls would show that four in 10 New Hampshire voters and uh, one in three um, Iowa voters, what Republican primary voters would not vote for Trump if he were convicted or would did not see he would be fit for president. All the polling shows that a conviction is very, very bad for Trump. It would likely cost him the, the election as of today. But he has every day between now and a verdict to try to undermine that outcome by, you know, raising questions about the, the politicization of it. Just, you know, all of his stuff about two tier systems of justice and Joe Biden's weaponizing the government against me and all of this. And so you're in this battle and there's going to be this tremendous asymmetry because Donald Trump, there are two people with the biggest bully pulpits or the or the biggest bullhorns in America. American politics are Biden and Trump and Trump will have every single day to make to claim that this it, it, the system is being rigged against them. It's a bunch of bullshit. That it's a liberal judge, blue city, liberal city. You know, all of that to try to deranged that prosecutor. Joe deranged Biden's, prosecutor. Joe Biden has me on trial. He's yeah. prosecuting me as as I'm running. Yeah, it's going to go. He's going to do all circus. of that because all he he's just got to move a, a a small handful of people to think that 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 the, the, the to think that it's been rigged against him. Right to not buy the verdict and not to buy a conviction as a disqualifying event, and Biden, who to date, for following the normal protocols of normal politics, the policies of the Department of Justice, has not commented at all on these federal investigations into Trump, is going to say nothing about it. Uh, it's I, I don't know how you do. It's like, hard I don't even know how to this imagine. And and like, what does the Democratic convention look like if every day the convention we have speakers at night? And Biden's out there speaking and the first lady and they get Obama to speak, whatever. And like split screen, Donald Trump's in court. Well, I <laughs> like what happens at the debate? If a debate were yeah. to happen, it's just it is this election is unprecedented in so many ways. I mean, you have an insurrectionist running. You have the former president running to get his job back. The we don't have a real, a real even base to understand what's going to happen because the 2020 election was so unusual because of it had, took place in a pandemic. And so it's incredibly impressive. But just like imagining how the these two sides are going to interact when one side has decided to, for all totally understandable reasons, to not talk about what is the biggest issue will be the biggest issue, the biggest news story happening every single day. But I imagine at the convention, everyone who does not work for the Biden administration can talk about it yeah, in some way, shape or form. But the president and I imagine the first lady and uh, the I vice mean, president would not. Nikki Haley's talking about it. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, of course, Democrats should talk about it. Yeah. We got we don't. At first, it was just, uh, you know, uh, PSA guest Chris Christie. Uh, but now, now now it's like Nikki Haley is out there talking about Trump yeah. and his trials and his immunity and the like it's of course we have to talk about it. And it is, and what I think Democrats have to recognize in this, because if Joe Biden's not going to talk about it, other Democrats are going to have to find a way to be pushed back against what Trump is saying, is Trump starts with an advantage here. 
In the polling last year when these indictments came down, the majority of people, including a majority of independents, thought that the that the one of the re, one of the main reasons why these indictments were happening was to stop Trump from winning the election. They believe that politics is at play here because that we people are incredibly cynical about what is happening right now. They're incredibly incredibly distrustful of government, and the voters who are going to decide this election are often the ones who are most cynical and most distrustful of politics. And so it's not simply you know just us all believing that this is going to be totally fine, and then a conviction in itself will stand. Trump has the ability to undermine it with enough people that he could still win when that happens. And this is the point where I should absolutely plug the latest episode of Polar Coaster, where I talked to Celinda Lake, the Democratic pollster, on this very question of how a conviction would impact the 2024 election. She's got a lot of really good insight from polls and focus groups she's done about how voters are uh, consuming the the trials and the indictments and, and how they're thinking about it. So check it out. I can't wait to listen to that one. I also think that for as much as you want to talk to voters now and do focus groups now, like it's just really hard to predict what the media and information environment is going to be like in the middle of a trial and what it's going to feel like if a jury convicts Trump and there's headlines all across the country and the world and and across in, in like an everyone's screen everywhere that says Donald Trump has been convicted. Um, or not convicted. Or not convicted, right? Yeah, right. or not convicted. And I do think how the trial, even and, and even before the conviction or or not conviction, um, how the trial plays out and how people understand how the trial is playing out, how it's covered, how it's talked about, not just from Donald Trump, but from the mainstream media by Democrats, everyone else, is going to be hugely important in how people process the information and ultimately make a decision about Trump's guilt and whether they're going to vote for him or not. I mean, it's just... Like the testimony, you know, there's this big story in the New York Times Magazine about Mark Meadows and all the cooperation he's done. What if someone? Oh yeah, we haven't like talked that. about that. Yeah, Meadows apparently Meadows got immunity, yeah. and and was and Ugh. sat down for five hours to talk about uh, Donald Trump, the guy who was his chief of staff with him during the from the uh, from the end of the November election through January sixth and after. He was right yep. there, and he just testified for five hours and got immunity. Who was the point of contact between? The Proud Boy, the War Room, the the Roger Stone was in with the Proud Boys and the White House. Like, it was, but then, like, there are these going to be these moments. There are, is there going to be a mistake someone right. makes that that is that Trump or other people can can use to suggest that the system is being rigged against them? It I mean, it's been a long time, very very long time since you've had a trial like this that has. I mean, really OJ, I guess. Before I was going to say people, this will be the b- bigger than OJ. This will be bigger yeah. than the OJ trial. But will there be cameras? No, right. I don't believe so now. But, yeah, that's, that's a know, huge difference. But, that is a huge but you difference. have Donald Trump going out every day if he's every there day. and speaking to the press. And how are what is the operation to push back against that when you if you know, what is Biden going to say at a rally when Trump says something, but he can't comment? It's all I mean, there are a lot of things to figure out here, but it is I mean, it's this giant all this is. Everything that we're talking about, about the economy and the jobs numbers and GDP and what the polling says and the border security, but all these things are very important and they're going to be in an election. Everything's important. But then we have hanging over your head the biggest, most unpredictable thing that's ever happened in a presidential election <laughs> ha- coming at some point, hopefully, right, depending on what the Supreme Court does. Yeah. And I do, you know, listening to the justices today and the fact that they didn't touch or didn't really talk about, you know, Colorado's decision, uh, the federal court in Colorado's decision that he participated in an insurrection it does make me think they're like, I, I can't, I find it really hard to imagine. And of course, anything is possible, but I find it really hard to imagine that the Supreme Court is going to say, you know what, we're going to kick this case. We're going to make it impossible to, to have this case heard before the election. I just find it, I find it really t- tough to believe that. But who knows? They're the Supreme Court and there's a bunch of Trump appointees on it and who knows. But it seems, I, I don't know. I don't know. From hearing them today, I don't, I think, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know either. Obviously, all the smart people seem to have that position. I will say there are moments when the fact that I'm a little older than you, or maybe significantly older than you, um, comes into play. And one of them is Bush I was Bush sitting uh, Bush v. Gore, right? I was in Florida in a room with all the smartest lawyers that worked for, for Gore. And they were all saying there's that 
And all the legal experts were saying that it seemed incredibly unlikely the Supreme Court would intervene and stop the count in Florida. Then the Supreme Court intervened and stopped the count in Florida. So anything, and that was a Supreme Court that was uh, much less political than this one. I'm just saying anything is possible here. I, I, if I had to bet one way or the other, I would bet the way you bet. But you know, it, like there's a middle ground where they just delay this thing so late that maybe the trial can't happen, right? right. Where they don't award. This is something they talked about in the, in the strict scrutiny pod that was very helpful. Is maybe they don't agree with Donald Trump's argument, but they hold hearings. They have a hearing and they make a decision and it pushes the case off long enough that it becomes impossible to, to finish it by October. And that, that may, that's probably not the outcome that John Roberts wants, but it may be the outcome that, that, uh, that enough MAGA justices want. Yeah. Although, as, as, as Kate said to love it on Wednesday's pod, um, everyone will know pretty early on in this process whether the Supreme Court is acting in a way that will push the trial past yep. November or not. And everyone should respond accordingly based on, you know, when they issue the stay, if they issue the stay, when they take the case, when they deny cert, not deny, right. All that stuff is going to tell us what the timeline is probably going to look like. So we will know soon enough um, what the plan is here. Today's presenting sponsor is Simply Safe Home Security. What's something that you think everyone should be able to have? Uh, peace sure. of mind. Peace. Hey, hey, hey they're hey. great. We also think that everyone should be able to feel safe at home. Same thing. That's why we recommend Simply Safe Home Security. Simply Safe is award winning, advanced, affordable protection designed so homes can be safe and secure for everyone. Here's why John Lovett enjoys it. I set up a Simply Safe system. I did it with my own two soft, soft hands. I did it, <laughs> uh, and it was very easy. It took only a few minutes and works great. App's great. Highly recommend it. Trusted by the experts, it was named Best Home Security System of 2024 by U.S. News and World Report. Simply Safe offers everything you need for whole home protection, HD cameras for indoors and outdoors, advanced motion sensors and entry sensors to protect doors, windows, and rooms, and a collection of hazard sensors that detect fire, flooding, and more. Easy to set up system, 60-day risk-free trial. You can uh, return it for a full refund. They even cover return shipping. Order now to get 20% off any new Simply Safe system with fast protect monitoring. Don't wait. Visit simplysafe.com slash crooked. That's simplysafe.com slash crooked. There's no safe like Simply Safe. Um, all right. Speaking of of just stomach turning <laughs> topics, uh, we save the the most fun for last. Uh, it appears Trump's 2024 opponent won't be getting indicted anytime soon. The Justice Department just released the final report from special counsel Robert Hur, who has decided not to charge Joe Biden with any crimes related to his own mishandling of classified information. Hur did find evidence that Biden, quote, willfully retained and disclosed classified materials after his vice presidency when he was a private citizen, but that evidence, quote, does not establish Mr. Biden's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. The report went on to say that a jury would need to find that Biden willfully retained the classified info. And then they speculated that the jury would be unlikely to convict because Biden and his lawyers would likely present him as a, quote, well-meaning elderly man with a poor memory. Uh, and it goes on to cite numerous examples of Biden having memory issues during his interview with the special counsel. It was basically just an in-kind donation to the Trump campaign from Robert Hur, a former Trump appointee and a former clerk for Justice Rehnquist, appointed by Trump to be U.S. attorney in Maryland. Um, though, as Biden pointed out in his response, uh, he spoke at the House Democratic Caucus on Thursday. The report also laid out the difference between Biden and Trump on the classified documents issue. As a special counsel wrote, and I quote, several material distinctions between Mr. Trump's case and Mr. Biden's are clear. And by the way, this is a Republican counsel. Most notably, after given multiple chances, this is the continuation of the quote, he returned classified documents and avoided, to avoid, and avoided prosecution. Mr. Trump allegedly did the opposite. This is the continuing quote. According to the indictment, he has not only refused to return documents for many months, he also obstructed justice by enlisting others to destroy evidence and then lie about it. That is the distinction. Uh, so this sucks. <laughs> I mean, the only is, it is like everyone remember what happened with James Comey in 2016 this is like uh, 50 or 60 years ago. Uh, <laughs> this was I mean, it wasn't a press conference, so I guess that part's better. But the report itself, like worse than what Comey did, because this guy went out of his way to just take shots at Joe Biden's memory. 
Only in our world can a report exonerating Joe Biden saying he will not be charged with a crime that Donald Trump was charged with and lays out in a clear detail, as President Biden just did, the differences between what Biden did and Trump did. Can that be bad news? Right. That should be good news. Right. He's not he has not been indicted. He's not been charged with a crime. But the absolute partisan hackery involved in doing this the way he did it is just I mean, it's it's honestly breathtaking. It is breathtaking the way he did this. He didn't have to do any of those things that wasn't necessary for it. The the part that Joe Biden read is why he Joe Biden wasn't charged with a crime. It's not that he has bad memory. Like what what did this guy think he was going to do? Joe Biden was going to get up there and the jury was going to be like, oh, I'm sure this guy forgot his classified information. That was not going to be the defense. It is. I mean, it's it's really. Um, I mean, I can only imagine how pissed the White House is. It is. It's pretty stunning. What? He, but maybe not surprising. And maybe should be an argument against appointing a Republican special counsel to work for Donald Trump to investigate Democratic presidents by choice, which is what Merrick Garland did. But just. It's bad. It is very bad. And it is and it's going to I think this is one of those things that is going to be it's going to be a, a topic of discussion for the next period here. This is gonna, there's going to be several news cycles about this because it. Oh, yeah. It's, it, there's always, it, you know, these things. There was these two moments that were Biden misspoke and said and gave the wrong names of uh, European leaders, which is something that I will say, having known Joe Biden a long time, he could have done. 20 years ago, right? Yep. Just that is not, it is not a sign of his age. It's just when he's up on stage, that happens sometimes. But when you have those two things, they're like bubbling. And then you have the special counsel do this. You can see it on Twitter. You can see it in the text messages that we've gotten from Democrats freaking out about it. Um, it's going to, it's going to kick off a, a panic cycle among Democrats and it's going to be really annoying. Yeah. I mean, I get it. Like, it <laughs> Look, so, it, you know, it, they, they go through and, and the, the characterization of Biden's memory, right? Because a lot of people in a lot of interviews uh, with investigators say, I have no memory of that. I have no memory of that. I do not recall. Right. Every, people are sending around clips. Trump did that in his interviews a bunch of times, a whole bunch of other people. Um, the Biden folks have put out, uh, sent a letter um, to the special counsel where they had tried to get them to um, take out some of the. Uh, more subjective descriptions of Biden's memory in there because they noted that, um, you know, at one point in the memo, uh, at one point in the report, uh, the special counsel talks about Biden's former counsel forgetting something and describes it as his memory of these events could well have faded over the course of more than six years. So like very like when other people <laughs> that they interviewed for this forgot something, they just said, oh, it could have it was a long time. They could have forgotten. Nobody. But with Biden, they were like, He's a senile old man. <laughs> like it was just yeah. that blatant. And, you know, they use examples of like he would say things like 2013. Was I still vice president then? Or 2009? Was I vice president then? At one point, if he forgot, he he couldn't remember the year that Bo died. And, you know, all of this is happening. It was a five hour interview, apparently, that took place the day after the October 7th attack uh, in Israel. And so and and they have this special counsel like thanking him. He's like, I know you're dealing with a lot right now. Thank you for sitting down for five hours. Right. So there's all these like extenuating circumstances. None of it's going to matter to the right or to like how this gets out in media, and how this hits mm. people. Right. People are just going to see like, you know, he's a uh, the, the line. He's like a, a well-meaning elderly man with a poor memory. Like, like that's just going to be what people remember. And so, uh, yeah, it's it's bad. And it, I, I like what do you do about it if you're the White House? I think the. Look, the, they have been dealing with age concerns from the very beginning, and it's not because of the media or Republicans. It's because like anyone who sees Joe Biden speak has that concern. And I think the only way to handle it is for Joe Biden to like go out there more and, and reassure people and talk and sit for long interviews and and you know debate donald trump and do all the things that you have to do like and if they're not confident he can do that then that's a bigger fucking problem but if they are confident he can do that then he got he's got to go do it because like you can yell at the media all you want and we can certainly yell at robert Hur because he's a fucking asshole for doing that and it was completely inappropriate but it's happened and people are watching joe biden every day and they're seeing clips of him on tiktok that are and other places in social media that are way worse <laughs> than when you actually speak to the man or see him sit down for an interview for a long time. And so I, I, I guess I think the only way through this problem is to, like, get out there more. I don't know. Yeah. What do you think? I I am. The other thing that happened this week that sort of led to this was the White House's decision to not have the president do the Super Bowl interview. Yeah. Which I sort of. 
people were very worked up about that. As someone who staffed six Super Bowl interviews, they're always sort of weird. Like they're all serious, very serious policy interviews while people are waiting, are eating wings, waiting for the Super Bowl to start. So it's always it's always weird. And so I was sort of like, yeah, I probably would have done it, but it's not. Everyone thinks it's an obvious layup, but people, no one wants to hear you talk about Gaza in Israel while they're waiting for the Super Bowl to start. Like that's just not how people consume information. But I might call them back and just say, let's do it right now. Yeah. Right. And it's yeah. And this, Biden was going to have to do things like this, no matter what came in, whatever Robert Hur, or the fuck his name is, says in his report. Like the, the this is not going to change the dynamic. It's just going to highlight the dynamic and just becomes a, a another reason why the dynamic of people being concerned about the president's age and competence will just, has brought has gone to the top of the news cycle again. Like in that NBC poll, and I can't remember the exact numbers, but I think there's like a 19 point swing between 2020 and now on who you believe to be more competent and effective between Biden had a nine point advantage in uh, maybe so even more than I think Biden had a nine, nine point advantage in 2020 and the in the NBC news poll right before the election. I think he's down 16 now. Um, and so part of that is people don't see enough Joe Biden. And the only way to change that is for people to see more Joe Biden. And this is just you're there are two parts of these things, right? There's a, how do you stop the new cycle from happening, which is something like doing the Super Bowl interview where you just tell people. And then there's how do you just start deal with a larger concern that is the largest impediment to Joe Biden's reelection, which is age and capacity, is to go out there and show everyone that you can do the job by engaging with people, being in debates, all of that. And so he's going to have to do that no matter what. I think the urgency probably like bumped up a few weeks because of this report. And, you know, when we were in the White House, we hated the part of – um you know, media coverage that was all about the president's performance, right? Was was no. was Barack Obama angry enough? Was he too aloof? Was he this? And then it's like the it's a, you know figure skating judges, I think, is what uh, Pluff used to call it. Yeah, uh, and they would they would judge you by your performance. But like that is unfortunately the reality we live in. And Joe Biden's performance when he speaks, when he gives an interview from now until November, is going to be a huge part of whether he wins the election or not. Huge. Because even like we've been talking about the economy as a challenge for him. And we've seen now over the last several weeks, economic sentiment is getting better. Consumer sentiment is getting better. It's starting to show up in the polls that people start are, people are thinking voters are thinking the economy is improving and it's not yet redounding to Joe Biden's benefit. And part of that is because the, 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 the concerns about his age persist and the only like the only way to to address that is with Joe Biden himself, right? Like the the campaign's message is good, the White House's message is good. He's been like I totally agree that he's been a excellent president. I have huge problems with his Gaza pro policy, huge problems, but like legislatively, domestically, like he's he's all of that stuff is firing on all cylinders. But like I'm telling you, like he's got to he's he's got to perform, right? And he's got to like allay these concerns and fucking Robert Hur just put them front and center. <laughs> well, I mean, the the next the Super Bowl interview, I will say one other thing about it is people generally think it's you're going to get 100 million viewers and you're not because the interview actually happens like two hours before the Super Bowl. Yeah. And so I think it's when the last one Obama did was like 15 million people. Trump had like 14 million when he did it. But that's still the biggest audience that he would get for a, for a while, except the State of the Union, which is coming up in a month, like a month from today. And that now... The stakes are always high in the State of the Union. They're always high in the last State of the Union before the reelect, and now they're even higher. Yeah. Um, and because and that, that'll be an audience of 20, 20, 30 million people. And I will say, again, this is not about the fact of whether he is competent and up for the job and 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 mentally all there mm -hmm. and all that kind of shit. Like I, I someone uh, was tweeting a, a excerpt from an old Politico story about Kevin McCarthy uh, or it said, like, on a particularly sensitive matter, McCarthy mocked Biden's age and mental acuity in public while privately telling allies that he found the president sharp and substantive in their conversations, a contradiction that left a deep impression on the White House. It's like, yeah, uh, guess yeah. what? <laughs> yeah, it's bullshit. Right. Yeah. And like, I, like I, I saw Biden uh, last December and he I said this before, like he remembered he recognized my mother in law having met her four years earlier at one Katie Porter event. And he like recognized her in the White House. And then 
told us stories and told my father-in-law stories about like the Bork confirmation with a level of detail that frankly was alarming. <laughs> it's not like he forgot anything. Like he knew every single thing that happened back in the seventies. So it's not like it's, it's not the fact of his, his mental acuity. It is the perception. And I realize that's frustrating, but like that it's, it's the biggest task. The biggest task is to fight that perception. This is a very important point you made, which is if the things that Robert Herr claimed in this report were happening all the time, we would all hear about it. Right. Because yeah. isn't that Biden's meeting with Republicans all the time? He's meeting with people who are with Democratic senators. Washington has a tremendous rumor mill. And just everyone would know if Biden was having huge mental lapses in meetings with people. It was just that you do it because it's, it is the single biggest issue in the election. And Democrats cannot stop panicking privately to reporters. So you would be hearing about it. And the fact that you're not from Republicans, or Democrats, other than the Republicans who were clearly lying like McCarthy, is evidence that what Robert Hur is saying is not an accurate portrayal of how Joe Biden is on every sing- on a daily basis. Right. I think that's really just important. Yeah, no, it is. And it's it well, but the sense you get from him a lot of times when he speaks is not that he's not all there, but it, it his performance feeds into the impression because sometimes it's low energy. Sometimes it seems like he's mumbling and swallowing his words. He's obviously got spinal issues. That means he's shuffling around. So it just it exudes old man, <laughs> even though like the words he's saying and his ability to like communicate in private with people is extremely sharp. So like that's just something that they got to work on. And it's ridiculous that the fucking fate of democracy depends on that. But that's where we are. <laughs> so- this is this is like our personal nightmare is that somehow <laughs> the thing we've decried in politics our entire careers yeah, I know. is that it comes down to optics. The things we the thing we hate most is going to be the, the fucking optics election. Great. Right. And we can all scream about optics or, you know, do something about it. So it's it's brutal. Um, all right. Enough of that. Uh, when we come back, uh, we're going to talk about the Super Bowl a little bit. Just to end on something light. This podcast is brought to you by Squarespace, the all-in-one website platform for entrepreneurs to stand out and succeed online. Everyone knows the holidays can take a toll on your bank account. If you're looking for creative ways to increase revenue and give your family and friends the holiday treats they deserve, then you need to get started with Squarespace's new feature, Squarespace Courses. Woo! Squarespace has the tools you need to create and sell your own online course. Uh, Start with the professional layout that fits your brand, upload video lessons to teach techniques and skills, and tailor your course with the powerful built-in Fluid Engine Editor. With Squarespace courses, you can create engaging content your audience will love, then simply add a paywall and set the price. Plus, you can charge a one-time fee or sell subscriptions. Is this our chance to do our own Trump University? I yeah. feel like this is nice. a... This is Crooked a, you. We're sitting on a gold mine here, Squarespace. Yeah. We have uh, one Takes 101. That's that's our oh, first first offering. I love that idea. <laughs> write someone write that down. <laughs> Takes. <laughs> I got it right here. Takes. That's a good one. Turn your creativity into income with Squarespace courses. Head to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to www.squarespace.com slash crooked to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. That's squarespace.com slash crooked. All right, we're back. And um I said we were going to come back and talk about the Super Bowl. So naturally, we had to bring on John Lovett. Boy, am I excited (laughs) to talk about the Super Bowl, an event I absolutely knew was happening this weekend. I certainly didn't ask in our meeting yesterday about this very episode. That's on Sunday. (laughs) At which point everyone's eyes turned away. And speaking of eyes, there will be 114 million pairs of them tuning into the big game on Sunday, Mm -hmm. during which they'll gamble on approximately $23 billion in Super Bowl wagers. And now it's your turn. Dan and John, it's time for the betting boys to put it all on the line. Here's how it works. I'm going to give you bets, then I will give you the odds. You have to decide whether or not you want to wager. In a game we're calling, all bets are shaken off. Now, here's how it's going to work. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, the stakes aren't cold hard cash. They're your dignity. Mm. On Thursday, we will check in and see which of you came out ahead and which of you came out behind. The losers reward humiliation. The loser will have to send out a painfully earnest tweet crafted by the team. Begging Taylor Swift to endorse Joe Biden. Oh, my goodness. Boy, am I glad I'm hosting instead of playing. It's both what's written on this and what I'm feeling. (laughs) But first, because our audience is a strong, quietly head to another room and listen to a podcast until the halftime show vibe, uh, we wanted to quickly answer the question, what is sports betting? And here's the gist. People bet on the game, but also on other silly aspects around the game, like how long the national anthem will be. And the less likely the predicted outcome, the longer the odds. And so the more you can win. To keep this simple... 
Each wager will be 100 crooked bucks. Each of you can make five bets. You must bet five times and there will only be seven opportunities. In other words, you can skip two. Okay. But you're going to have to bet five times. Okay. 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 But you can skip a max of two. Okay. I'm going to take some notes here then. This is complicated. First up, what color will the Gatorade dumped on the winning team be? Uh, you can choose between orange, red, or blue. Orange, the odds are plus 240. No yellow, huh? Blue, the odds are plus 430. Red, the odds are plus 490. I'm sorry. Could you do the odds again? Orange, 240. Blue, 430. Red, 490. Red being the longest shot and the most delicious. I'm going to take orange. Can we can we both take the same bets? Or no? Yeah, you can if you okay. want. You're going to take her. And what are you going to wager? You have to wager. You're raging 100. So you're just going, 100 for, the, everything. You're going for the plus 240. 100 on everything. So we're not yes. splitting our 100 up among the five no. bets. No, no, no. Okay. You have Thank 500. You're going to bet five confusing. times. You're going to bet. So try to simplify it. You can bet and five times. The, but then the winner is the person who makes the most money. Correct. Not who wins the most bets, right? Correct. Correct. Thank you. Yes, okay. Dan. <laughs> that is right. Yes. <laughs> you got it. Perfect. Okay. Um, and I didn't have to Google how do sports betting work? What does the plus 240 minus 110 mean? I had to like figure it all out. Mm -hmm. I didn't have to do that. All right, Dan, you want in on the Gatorade bet? Yeah, I will take the red. Wow. Dan takes the red. What did you take? You took orange. orange? Yeah. John. Yep. Okay. What surprise guest will Usher bring out during his halftime show? Ooh. You have three options: Justin Bieber, it's minus two hundred. That so just so people understand, if you bet one hundred, mm -hmm. you'll net fifty. Mm -hmm. Okay. Nicki Minaj plus three ten, Taylor Swift <laughs> plus five fifty. I actually think those are pretty. That I would think you'd get better odds on that if I was being yeah, honest. Yeah, I thought so too. That'd be wild. Wild. But there that's what that's hey, that's what the sports book says. And I, I listen to what they're trying drum. they're they're trying to get people to bet that's Taylor Swift money because it's free money for the sports books. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um and so what Bieber is what? Just minus two hundred. You bet one hundred, you're gonna net one, you're gonna net fifty. Mm, uh, sure. People, I guess, are they, the people are, would not be surprised to see Justin. I'm skipping this one. Da yeah. John's I'm out. Skipping the, well, I'm skipping. I don't think. I don't think, I don't think any of them are. Yeah. No. I think. I think people know Bieber's coming, which is why the odds are so poorly. Mm. I insisted on this question: Who will have more completions, Purdy or Mahomes? Mahomes. <laughs> Mahomes. <laughs> And, I, and I, I don't think it means sexual completions. I think it must mean some sort of sports thing, catching and throwing and so forth. Uh, they're, you know, obviously, I, I don't know who I like more, Purdy or Mahomes. Uh, anyway. Uh, what, do you, what do you have to give up for Mahomes? It's, it's 100. <laughs> it's plus 110 for both. It's just who's going to have more between the two of them. They're basically, they're, they're even. Uh, plus 110 for either. I'll take Mahomes. I'm going to take Purdy. Wow. There it is. There it is. Love it. Just as a piece of information that I think you would appreciate is that Brock Purdy was the last pick in the draft, which, is, oh. which means that he is known. The last pick of the draft is always known as Mr. Irrelevant. And so it is quite a story that Mr. Irrelevant is playing in the Super Bowl as a starting quarterback. What a mean name for somebody who gets to be in the end. You know what? The, the, the irrelevant people are the people that weren't picked at all. Yeah, well, well usually sucks, the person who's no picked last knows. doesn't last in the NFL very long. So right, right, right. <laughs> this right, is their right, fame right. to fame right there. Next up. Will Taylor Swift win more Grammys or will the Chiefs of Kansas City uh, score more touchdowns? So the odds for Taylor having more Grammy wins, that's minus 200. Are we talking more total Grammy? Like she's, we already know her Grammy wins. Right, we already know. Right. But, and, but it's just many, not this year it? or to, this, this year, It must be this right? year. It has yeah. to be this year. Yeah, I mean, it's, otherwise it's like 23, so it would be. <laughs> right, no, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Will Taylor have won more Grammys this year or will the Chiefs score more touchdowns in the Super Bowl? Uh Taylor, Taylor having the edge, that's minus 200. Chiefs scoring more touchdowns, that's plus 150. Did she... Uh, let's, let's look. We can, we can look up how, how many, many Grammys, Grammys did she win? She only won two. Oh. oh. And the Chiefs have more touchdowns? Chiefs, tu Chiefs touchdowns. Mm -hmm. Oh, I think... So will the Chiefs she, have three or more touchdowns is really what it's saying. That's what it's saying in the end. If Taylor has one more Grammys, minus 200. If the Chiefs score more touchdowns, plus 150. If they have the same, push. I'll let you go first, Dan, because I've been going first. I'll take the Chiefs scoring more touchdowns. Mm. Uh, I'll take that, too. Wow. Okay. 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 Next up, 
Will Travis Kelsey have more catches than Taylor Swift Grammy nominations? Hmm. Over 6.5 catches, that's minus 200. Under 6.5 catches, plus 135. Wait, will they have more? What? What's the? What is it? Will ta- Will Travis Kelsey have more catches? Oh, Kelsey's ca- okay. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Catches. You know, and it's six and a half is the line. Six and a half is the line. Over six point five minus two hundred. Under six and a half plus one thirty five. Wow, so he must be very good. That's a yeah. lot of times to catch it. I assume six. He is. He's good. He's quite good. Uh, I'll do the. I'll do the over. All right, over. All right, you know it's a. It's it's. It's not good money. But Dan, what do you think? I will also do the over. Wow. Okay. 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 Who really, will be the f- right now? This contest is coming down to the Gatorade color. <laughs> <laughs> As it no, should. no, 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 no. Purdy versus Mahomes. Yeah. Oh yeah. But the, I have the Mahomes odds for... on the but but the odds on uh, if the it's Gatorade, red Gatorade, Gatorade. then I'm yeah, walking you, away. If, with if it's red yeah. Gatorade, it doesn't matter. Dan, Dan's walking away with this fucking thing. <laughs> 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 I hope it's not red Gatorade. Um, I mean, both right. teams are red. So we have two. How many times have they bet? One, two, three. I have, I have four bets for myself. Wait, so that means I skip. We skip. Oh, we skip. We skip. Skipped skipped one. Okay, okay, okay. Um, I, I skipped Usher too, so we both yeah. have four bets. So we both have one one bet left. Okay, okay, okay. And, you, and I'm guessing you have two more. Yeah, we're doing both of them. Fuck it. Uh, yeah. Who will be the first person shown next to Taylor Swift during the Super Bowl? Uh, Jason Kelsey plus five hundred. Ed Kelsey plus nine hundred. Scott Swift plus seven hundred. Cara Delevingne plus nine hundred. Gigi Hadid. Plus one thousand, good. Wow, you can, that's a that those are that's that's exciting, huh? You see Gigi Hadid in that fucking booth, thousand dollars. <laughs> that's cool as hell. Shown next so, to Taylor Swift. Oof. So we have to Sh- bet. We have, what if what so if, it's, it's, it's really tough. Like, how do they do this bet? What if what if we see uh, Taylor and Jason is next to her and Kara's on the other side, which is very possible. I don't I don't know. Then how, the vet I probably voids. Then the vet the bet void. The bet void. You mm. also can skip to the next one. You don't have to do this bet. You can skip. Can this we one. can we hear the next one and then come? No. Oh, okay. Okay. No. no that's fair. That's fair. That's like, okay. I'm gonna skip this one. Like I don't want again. Do it's it. Jason no, Kelsey. I don't want to do it. I don't. Ed I'm skipping. I'm skipping. <laughs> Cara Delevingne, skip Gigi Hadid. Okay. Skipping. Finally, you both have to bet. The most important question: <laughs> Will Travis Kelsey propose to Taylor Swift? Yes. Plus one thousand, which is crazy. Which is like, I think it's more likely that Taylor is seen with Gigi Hadid. The, roughly the same odds as Taylor and Gigi Hadid, and uh, Taylor getting proposed to. It must mean that, yeah. Anyway, uh, the no is unfortunately minus three thousand. What? Which means that if you bet your hundred, you could net three dollars. <laughs> so the question is, do you want those three dollars? Which I don't. Which could make the difference if we I uh, crunch some numbers. Or, but you, otherwise gonna, you lose a hundred dollars. Well, sure, but that's because it's not going to happen. <laughs> no, no, no. If you bet, if you, if you right, well, like I'm saying you're betting. That's the thing. You, you're betting on a dream. You're betting on love. <laughs> you can, you can just try to keep your hundred and maybe win three dollars, or you can push your chips forward and think Travis gets on one knee. And yeah, I'm gonna. I guess uh, yeah, I should have bet on the. Should have bet on the. Jason Kelsey yeah. next to The Ed Kelsey bet. Which <laughs> the Ed, Ke- <laughs> the Ed Kelsey. Ed Kelsey. Yeah. It's, I feel bad for Ed Kelsey in this because it's like, I think Ed Kelsey being seen next to Taylor Swift is only slightly less likely than the proposal. More likely than but the like, proposal. But like, why not? Why not? Uh, it, Travis Kelsey's mom? Like, why is she I, not because, on that? Yeah, I was going to say, why is she not on that? Because those are Why not Jason not Kelsey's what about, wife? What about Brittany Mahomes? I don't yeah. know who any of those fucking people are, but <laughs> the point is, these are the ones I think that gave you that had real exciting odds. Yeah. Okay. But you know what? We can't go backwards. Okay, I'm just gonna bet okay. no then. And You're just betting get my, no. Get my three dollars. Yeah. You won't bet on the. You won't bet on Dan. Come on, I'm, gonna, I'm betting. No. I'm also betting no. But I would have bet if you if there had been. What are the odds on? He gets out on one knee for process. She says no. <laughs> okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. All right, you know what? Let's make this more interesting. I'm taking the odds up to two thousand. 2,000 that, that Travis will get on one knee. You'll take the whole fucking thing. Mm-mm. Come on, Dan. No, it's not, there's no way it's happening. Why? Oh, she, okay, she Usher brings her out. She performs. Travis one, runs out onto the field from the locker room and then asks her to marry him after the performance. You want that? What, <laughs> what <laughs> happens? What happens if someone dumps red Gatorade on <laughs> Travis Kelsey after he proposes? And then Robert Hur walks out on the field, indicts them all. Yeah. 
No, no. <laughs> <laughs> no fun for anybody. Trump 2024. <laughs> all right. Well, we all, we all heard it. We all have the odds. Basically, a lot riding on red Gatorade at this point. <laughs> and uh, and well, which, qu- in which quarterback uh, has more completions. Yeah, that, and that's what this was always the thing that was most important to me. This Purdy <laughs> fellow versus Mahomes. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll run the numbers. We'll crunch the numbers and we'll see what happened. And uh, we'll see who has to... Uh, Beseech Taylor on social media. Can't wait. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everyone. We'll talk to you on Tuesday.